Hey everybody, Robert with RC Archery. You are watching part one of most likely a two-part series on what steps you need to take to help you hold steadiest on target. In today's video, I'm gonna be giving you a few areas that you can look at that's gonna help you with the most steadiness, jumps and gains early on. And then in the next video, I'm gonna be going over some more advanced topics and the next steps that you need to take and to help you hold steadiest on target. Also, I wanted to give a quick rundown of an instructional video that I just came out with so that I can have an announcement here on this channel as well. This instructional video is about target panic. So I created a video and have been going through a process now for a long time trying to figure out how to put it into video format. And basically what I wanted to cover with it and what I, you know, how I wanted to be able to put it out for all of y'all. This video is taking a medical approach on how to determine what our triggers are and what we're actually dealing with with the target panic. So what our problem is, holding low on target, finger to the trigger, pulling through the shot. I mean, there's a multitude of areas it could be. So this video, I actually go through a step-by-step -step process on how to single out and how to identify those triggers. And then I start giving you a two-step approach on how to start getting those integrated back in and building your shot back up to where you wanna be. After that, I actually break down your shot. I help you find your shot window, your shot timing, the way to work through your releases, the way to set up your releases, and hopefully that will help you build and rebuild your shot into a way that keeps you from having an issue with target panic in the future, at least very minimal and minimizing the effects of what happens if it does happen again later on down the road. The way that I'm taking care of this is actually a medical approach that they use on how to treat OCD, so obsessive compulsive disorder, if you've heard of that, it's incredibly similar. It's, it's essentially the same thing that we're seeing with our target panic. The way that they treat OCD is by cognitive behavioral therapy, and they break that down into two different sections. So that's what I'm going over in that video, finding the trigger, figuring out what the trigger is, and then a replacement for that trigger. And then the way that I go about it is I help you integrate your shot back into that. So I don't use the gimmicks of taking your side off the bow and doing things like that unless it's an extremely bad case of target panic and that is necessary. I'm also helping you in a lot of instances not have to spend $200 to buy another release. It's helping you use what you have and set it up correctly and how to attack that approach to where if that release is your trigger, how to build that release back into your shot, how to build the target back into it, your aiming reticle and all of that. So if you're interested in that video, comment down below, email me, I'll have my email down in the, the description below, and I'll also have a link to that video as well. If you're a member here on my YouTube channel, you're gonna get a special pricing for that, so definitely send me an email if you're a member of this channel and let me know if you'd like to have that and I'll go over that pricing with you as well. Everything, again, down in the description below. All right guys, enough about that. Let's get into today's video. All right, so the first area that I wanna talk about is our bow shoulder and then this area and this side of our body, how that looks and what we're needing to do with it. So, as you know, I and some other people that talk about your form, we like to use a T formation when we're looking at our form. If you're not familiar with that, what that means is hold your hands out to the side, our body makes a T. It's essentially what we're doing here. When we're looking at just the bow shoulder and bow side of our body that is holding it up, there's some different things that we need to look at and what we wanna do. A lot of people, when they are trying to have their arm and their shoulder, especially in a flat position, and their arm out to create this T form, will over exaggerate it and push out. And when you're doing that, if you try to reach, you're actually taking the, the socket, the muscles that surround it, and then your core, you're taking those muscles and that stability away. So the way that I like to handle this may be a little bit different from what you've heard in the past, but it's what I have found that works best for me. And it works a lot for most archers that I've worked with as well. I'm gonna give you the whys behind why I'm doing this, and that way, if it's not working as well for you, you can make the adjustments necessary in order to make it work better for you. So, with that in mind, and what I'm saying with that is, I do not want my shoulder socket to be outstretched. I want it to be 
actually a little minimally compressed. So what I mean by that is our scapula in our back, I actually have that scapula, um, the bone and, and the muscles and everything surrounding it shifted over towards my spine just a little bit on the bow side. Now I don't do this so much that I'm cramped up and my shoulder starts to rise up, but if I take my hand from my side with no weight, nothing in it, and I just lift my arm up, this is essentially the, the segment of how my shoulder is going to react when I'm holding my bow. The only thing that I do different from here is instead of being in this position, I actually let it come back just a little bit. So from here to here. And honestly, I don't even know if that's gonna show up on camera. Um, but that's how I set that up. Now, along with that, that allows me to be able to use the muscles in my core, in my back, and in my shoulder to hold my arm still. So I am almost flexing these muscles in this area to actually shrink the available movement allowed in my shoulder joint. That's gonna help me hold my arm steadier on target. Now, if you are an archer that needs to really pull through your shot and there's a lot of motion on your release side, this may not work as well for you because there will be a decrease in range of motion for what our scapula and those muscles on the release side of our body are allowed to do. They can't push over into the spine as much because these muscles are already you know, moving over that direction in that way. For me, it's not an issue and here's why. When I'm setting up my shot, I'm getting on target. I'm setting that bow shoulder to where I have that tension in it. It's a little bit um, pulled into my spine. I'm actually doing that when I draw the bow back. So when I lift the bow up and I'm drawing it back, I'm already in that position. It's really hard to get from here and pull it back because everything wants to ride up. But if I start here, essentially what I do is I have a very relaxed bow elbow and a relaxed area here in my shoulder and I just lift everything up and then draw it back. And then when I go to anchor, I will push out a little bit with the bow elbow and I pull back a little bit with uh, the release hand, arm, that area. And then I do that and I create my tension. That tension is what I'm gonna do to watch my shot, see everything kind of settle, my sight picture settle down, whatever it looks like for that day, smallest movements possible type thing. And then I don't move a ton through my shot at that point at all. Um, so that's why I'm locking my body in as I like to call it. Now, not as dynamic, if you are an archer that thinks that you need to be dynamic in that range of motion, by all means, do it. But don't let your shoulder get out of socket. Just lift your arm up naturally here. You still have a lot of range of motion in that point. That's what I'm doing with my bow shoulder. If you wanna see a more in-depth version of this, the muscles that I'm using, the process that I'm doing, and then some exercises for you to do and some drills for you to do to be able to feel this and um, replicate it on target. That's gonna be this week's membership video. So if you're a member of my YouTube channel, that'll be your special video that you can go on there and watch. If you're not a member of the channel and you want to be, down in the description below, there is a link for that. Gives you the pricing, gives you your access, what you get, um, ability to be able to pick my brain for your form shot, different things like that. So you'll be able to see that program and how that works. All right, so the next thing that I'm gonna talk about is probably pretty obvious to most archers, and you may even wonder why I didn't do this first. Next thing that we're talking about is our bow's draw length, the length of our loop, and then how to find those measurements on you to rough that in to begin with and then fine tune it later on. Here's why I didn't start with this. Our bow shoulder creates our body's draw length. We need what we're doing with our arm, whether we have it a little bit compressed, or in a natural state, we need to have that defined and be able to find that position before we set our draw length. Now, if you're a brand new archer, there's a couple ways that we can do this to find it. The best me measurement method that I have found is taking a tape measure, taking the base of the palm, I'll show you this really up close. So we wanna get right here in the base of our palm where this crease is and where everything kind of is static right here. We wanna measure from this area to the center of our sternum. Now, when we're doing this, we wanna be very careful of what we're doing with our bow arm. That changes this measurement number a lot. If we lift our arm up and we're more closed this way or more open this way, that can drastically change your measurements. So lift the arm up from your side. It's okay if it's straight across your body. You may be you know, a little bit different right here. This is a rough measurement. 
but we're going to do this and have it directly from the palm of our hand into the center of our sternum. Have somebody measure this for you so that you can do it and get a little bit better accuracy on your measurement. And then whatever that number is, that is going to be very close to what you need to be to start for your measurements for your bow. I have found this to be very accurate for a lot of different range of archers from young youth archers all the way to adults. Um, this is the way that I've measured our kids to be able to help them be able to see what length they needed on their bow when they were seven and it worked great for them then and it works great now for them as well when we're changing. So when you get a bow, there's a multitude of different ways to look at draw length. A lot of people think you're just measuring from the front of the riser to the string when you're at full draw. That's not technically what it is. A lot of people also think that the numbers on your cams are the draw length as well. And it's not always the case. So there is a variance that they allow a bow manufacturer to have when they set these bows out. And there's a variance in poundage and there's a variance in draw length. And it can be vastly different depending on which model of bow you have. So keep that in mind whenever you're doing this. The most accurate way to measure this, if you need to know for specifications later on or different things, is to have a draw board. Draw the bow back safely in the draw board, get it at full draw. I do it to where the stops are just touching. Obviously that's not where we're shooting them at, but that is the most accurate way for me to do that and be consistent from one time to the next when I have to draw it back. Cause I mean, it's just a little bit different. Technically, I guess you could have um, a scale on your draw board and draw it back to the holding weight that you're using to shoot, but it gets kind of convoluted at that point. I don't think it needs to be that accurate on our measurements. If you need to do this and you want to do this, generally speaking, the majority of bows, you go from the center point of the hole for the burger button and measure from there to the back of the string or front of the string, however you want to look at that, the sight side of it. You're going to measure from there and then you're going to add 1.75 inches to it. So one and three quarter inches to whatever that measurement is. And that's AMO draw length. Now for me, when I'm doing my tuning and what I need to do, I literally clip a tape measure on the front of my riser because it's easy for it to hold it there. And I have it go to the string point and I measure it that way. And that's a lot of the times the way that I make my notes because it's easy for me. It's a lot easier than having to figure out where the center of the burger button hole is, or technically what it is is the, the point here where the grip and everything meet. So it's a lot easier to find it that way and to keep my measurements. But if I need to know an accurate AMO measurement, that's how I'm doing it. When we're setting up our cams to 28 and a half, 28, 27, 30, whatever your draw link ends up being, setting that up to where we're getting our O arm in a natural position. And if at any possible, the string is just touching the tip of our nose and it's coming down somewhere around the corner of our mouth. What I look for in an archer when I'm roughing this in for them is where our knock clips onto the string and that little area there where the D loop is tied and all of that. I try to get that if you drew a straight line up to be somewhere in the eye socket. And depending on the length of your nose, the axle to axle cam height, string angle of the bow, all of that has a lot to do with where that falls and what you're looking at. But typically, as long as you're not exceeding your eye, you're not getting too much face contact with the bow because the string is digging into the face a lot. Um, and if you're not in front of the eye, the string is coming back to your nose, you're not having to hunch forward, lean your head way forward, do anything crazy like that. Typically, that's what I'm gonna do with an archer. Make sure you're standing upright. Our bow's draw length is what we're using to set up this half of our body, our bow side of our body. Second equation to this is the loop length. And a lot of people don't know anything about what they're supposed to do with this. They don't understand it. They're not doing it correctly and no one's ever taught them about this. So our loop length is what controls the leverage that we have over our bow when we're pulling it, holding it at full draw and shooting our shot with what we see with our float picture. The reason it controls our leverage and what I mean by that is our hand being forward on our face or further back on our face changes this elbow, changes the height of it usually. Further forward on my face, my elbow is higher, further back the elbow gets lower. The lower our elbow gets, the less overall leverage we have on that bow. 
Now, I have a formula and a computer program that I get this done with on Archers. I can visually see it usually and I can ask a few questions to you and I can help you kind of get to that motion and what you're wanting to look for to get your loop link dialed in. Um, but the computer program is a great start and it's a good way to illustrate it for people. Everybody that I have done this test on when I was doing the research to develop that program and the way that it lines itself up is it, somewhere within the parameters of the way that I set up what I call a leverage line and it's the height of our elbow versus the wrist on our bow hand. And every archer except for one that I've done this with, professional high-ranking high amateurs, people that are good shots, everybody but one fell into this category. And the one that does not shoots incredibly well, he is just an outlier. I, I don't know what else to say about that. Everybody else, I know what you need to do. And it's based on your shot style. It varies a little bit whether you pull harder or don't pull harder, whether you're more dynamic and move more in your shot, whether you move less in your shot and all of that good stuff. It also depends on the, the length that we have on our release. If this neck length on our release is long, we don't need as long of a D-loop. If it's really short, we need a longer D-loop. If you're using a Carter release um, that doesn't have the flop hook that goes across and it just has the wedge that goes across, typically the neck length on those is shorter and you need a longer loop length, so keep that in mind. If you're using a true ball or a Stan, um, you know, or some of those releases that are more popular like that, they're pretty standard on most of their releases and you'll find a pretty normal motion. If you're using an index finger release, then all bets are off. It really just depends on what you've got. So everybody uses those a little bit different. Typically, half an inch is what I see a lot of people. When you measure this loop length, I'll show you how I'm measuring it and what I'm looking for. I actually use a micrometer when I do this. You don't have to do that. I use a tape measure for a long time. But we are measuring from the outside of the string to the inside of the loop where our release hooks onto it. This measurement from here to here, I see a lot of people at half an inch. Generally, that is too short unless you have a really long neck on your release or you're using some form of an index release. Um, or if you have the string coming way further back on your face. Typically, that's too short. Normally, what I'm seeing with archers is somewhere around three quarters of an inch. So if you wanna take the time to fine tune this and that's important to you for your overall accuracy, watch your float pattern, watch your groupings, watch your misses because you know if, if you're jerking through because you have too much leverage over the bow or it's losing the leverage over the bow and it's wanting to fall down and you just feel like the bow is really heavy and that's good telltale signs to be longer or shorter. So three quarters of an inch, pretty standard. Um, it goes up to an inch. I see a few archers over an inch, depending on your face shape, what you're doing with releases, bows, that kind of nature. Um, but yeah, I mean, mine's right around that three quarters, seven eighths of an inch area on most of the bows that I use now. I've gone as far as um, right at an inch in the past. I've never gone shorter than three quarters of an inch. Doesn't work for me. I have a pretty long nose, so um, I need a longer loop usually on bows unless they have a, a tighter string angle, a more sharp string angle. Um, but yeah, pretty self-explanatory. If you have any questions on that, post them below. I'll answer them and uh, try to guide you through that as much as I can. If you want handheld guidance on that or a short, quick version for the guidance on that to get you on target faster, that is a program that I offer as far as coaching package. It's just for draw length and loop length and your form and setup. Um, it's 30 bucks. I'm gonna put you into my computer program, show you exactly where you are, and then give you guidance. That computer program, I can get you within typically one quarter to one eighth of an inch in overall total draw length. So the bow's draw length and the loop length. And then from there, I tell you how to manage your shot, what you're seeing down range, the leverage points that you're getting. We talk through that, and then that helps us dial down what we need to change exactly and get you holding your best with your draw length and with your loop length. All right, the last one that we're gonna talk about in this video is pretty short and sweet, but I'm gonna give you the details on why it is important in the way that we need to set everything up. It's our peep height. Peep height plays such a big role in the steadiness that we see on target, and so many people overlook this. This generally gets set at your local pro shop. They put it somewhere where they think that it works, they may have you draw the bow back a couple times and look at you and then say, you're good to go. Um, they can cause a multitude of problems for you though. And depending on the way that you're shooting and what you're doing with the bow and the way that you've got things set up, 
you may need something completely different than what they set you up at the pro shop for to specify what you're doing with your shot and with your equipment. So when I am setting up my peep height, there's a few things that we want to take into consideration. We do not want to bend our head forward or backwards or push it forward or pull it backwards or we don't want to be tilting our body. We do not want to adjust our body and our form to our bow. We want to adjust our bow to our form and our body because we don't want to change as much as possible from shot to shot. And if we're in a natural state for our body and way that we're setting up and the way that our form is, it's much easier to remain in that from one to the next. So draw the bow back with your eyes closed and get into a, a solid anchor where you feel comfortable and strong in what you're doing. And then open your eyes and see where your peep sight is in relation to your scope. Use that as an adjustment point and adjust it up and down from there. This will get you a very quick, rough estimate of where you need to be. For the majority of archers, this is all you'll ever need to do. And it will help you shoot so much more consistently and have so much better steadiness on target. Now, if you're an archer that is going to be doing target archery, if you're going to be doing some fun events like tack um, or field or 3D or whatever that is, and you're going to be adjusting your sight or not adjusting your sight, then there's some more stuff that we need to do. So if you're an archer that shoots one distance, say this is your indoor bow, you're set up for 20 yards or it's an outdoor bow and you're only shooting 50 meters or whatever you may be doing and you only need that one distance, set your peep height for that distance and shoot it in. Get a rough estimate of where you need your scope to be for that distance. Do the test that I just told you to do, you know, as far as drawing it back with your eyes closed, do that a few times, get it into a good position, tie the peep in and then go shoot. And if you're not comfortable with what you're doing with your anchor point, it feels a little bit off, you're missing a little bit here and there, adjust it up and down and get that perfect for that distance. If you are doing multi-distance, some form of archery, whatever that may be, then we need to change that and we need to do things a little differently. For 3D, take the couple different approaches here. If you know a specific range and what you're doing with 3D because you shoot a specific class and you know where you're gonna be at because the average yardage for your class is X yardage, you know, between here and here. Set your peep up to be comfortable there. If I'm shooting a known class and I know that it can get out to 50, 55 yards and say the majority of my shots are in the 40s, you know, somewhere in that area, I'm gonna set my peep height to where I'm comfortable in the 40s. And then I can adjust it a little bit more or less, you know, with, with what I'm doing with my anchor, with a trick that I'll tell you here in a minute, and I can get everything really good on target to be able to shoot. Now, if you're shooting where it's a further distance on a field course or a tack event or something like that, then you may wanna do it differently. So I wouldn't take, so say you're shooting from a short distance out to 100 yards or whatever you're doing. Don't split that distance in half and set your peep there. As you go further back, your gap gets bigger on either the marks that you're looking at or the distance in between your pins or whatever you're doing. The distance in that gap gets larger the further you go back. So the mid distance isn't technically the mid height for what you're looking at through your peep. So when I'm setting up a bow and I want to get it to shoot 100 yards, I will probably set my peep height somewhere in the 60 to 70 yard range. That allows me to be able to still be comfortable at 100 and not be hanging off my face or not doing anything crazy with what I'm anchoring with and the way that I have to move my face or whatever's going on. And then it allows me to shoot up close at 20 yards or less. And you know, I may be a little cramped, but I can still get into my anchor point and I'm comfortable there. So make sure that you're doing that. It's setting it up the same way we talked about before. Get a rough idea where your scope needs to be, where your, your height needs to be for that distance, and then shoot that distance in by adjusting the peep up and down and getting comfortable with it and getting where you need to be. Now, beyond that, there's a lot more that goes into it. That is a very high level overview of it. Um, if you want to really, really dive into the rabbit hole of this, there's a very good podcast that was done on it recently on Bow Junkies podcast with Paige Pierce. They go into um, like a two hour spiel of archery and a lot of it is based on sight marks, peep height settings, and what you're looking in for the minutia of all that. But 
That is a super important issue to make sure that it's there and to also make sure that this peep sight is set up in relation with your loop to where when you get to full draw, it's in a straight line back to your eyeball. That's where this little device comes in. You can tie some string in there. You can find devices like this on Lancaster Archery. Um, you can make something for it as long as it's smooth, whatever you're doing. That will help you align the way that your peep is going in your string so that when you're getting to full draw, it's a little bit better for you. You don't want the peep turned to where you're only seeing part of it and it, you know, you feel like you gotta move your head around some stuff like that. All right guys, thanks for watching part one of this video series on helping you hold steadier on target. Hopefully these tips will help you a lot in getting things going for you. I will get part two filmed for us and get that out for you and have some advanced areas that we can look at and how to help you. Again, if you wanna see more on the bow shoulder, the steadiness of it, the setup of it, how to feel it and how to get there, I'm gonna have that in my membership only video. If you need some information on that, check out the description below this video and it'll have that for you in a way that you can uh, join the channel too if you want. I appreciate everybody watching this video today. If you are a member of this channel, thank you for your support on that. I'll see you soon.